What if walls could talk? What stories would they tell? They probably reveal stories about the history of the place, where they were built, and the lives of those who walked through the buildings and neighborhoods where they're located. I'm David Yokley Mitchell, the Executive Director of the Atlanta Preservation Center. Welcome to If Walls Could Talk. Hey everybody, today we're at the May Patterson Goodrum home, right on West Paces Ferry. After 100 years, this house is still here. Let's go see what's going on inside. This is built in 1929. I mean, this is pretty spectacular. There's probably not something else like this in the city, this, this caliber and this kind of preservation of status. This is Pretty remarkable. Oh, look who it is, David. Barbara Hyde. Good to see you. Good to see you. Tell us who built the house, tell us you know, the aspects of what made the house, but really why we're here and why we're fortunate to be here right now and how you came to steward this space. Okay, um, well originally designed by Philip Trammell Schutze uh, about 1929 for May Patterson Goodrum and she moved in September of 1930 of that year. So, um, middle of the, you know, start of the depression. Um, as you certainly. would. Yeah. <laughs> and he designed it as an English Regency style home, something that she loved, um, that she had experienced while she was on a trip to Europe. She loved British antiques, which you'll see a lot throughout the house, as well as Asian antiques mixed in. So, Chippendale balustrade um, certainly goes with uh, the rest of the house, sort of an eclectic uh, mix of things. You'll see three different artists here. Herbert Millard, who did the wonderful carving. We'll see more of his work in the living room. Alan Cox, who is the artist for the murals in the dining room. And Athos Menaboni, who is the muralist for the breakfast room. And they all connected um, to Schutze throughout his career. It's interesting, you know, I think in history books you always, modernism is touted as, you know, what was going on at that time. But in fact, there were really great pieces of classical architecture going on as well. Um, and Philip Schutze was certainly one of the great architects that was, um, you know, a proponent of that. May Patterson Goodrum did not grow up um, in this kind of wealth. And uh, her father left the family fairly early. It was just her and her mother. And so she had to go to work probably right out of high school. We're not sure that she even graduated high school. And she started working at Jacob's Pharmacy, um, rose to the level of a buyer. And when she was in her um, early 30s, decided to open up an interior design antiques shop with her partner, um, Alice Porter. It was there that she probably met J.J. Goodrum, and he was from Noonan, Georgia, also connected with Coca-Cola, a house that Coca-Cola built. Sure. <laughs> um, he was one of the managers of what we would have said was the IPO of Coca-Cola. They married in 1926, and unfortunately by 1928 he had passed away. Um, and that left her with no children. He had had no previous children either. And she decided that her and her mother would build this house here. So the home was really built for two women. Um, her mother passed away in 1941. She lived here until 1958. At that point, she moved out to another home that she had Philip Schutze designed for her out on Sea Island. Mm -hmm. And another set of women moved in here, Mary Rushton and her daughter White. They lived here until the early 80s. And then it was eventually purchased by the Southern Center for International Studies. And it stayed that way up until 2009. And the house had fallen into more benign neglect. And the Watson Brown Foundation purchased it at that point and decided to return it to its former glory. Check this out. This wasn't like this when you got it, was No, it was not. So how did that start? Well, we spent one year just studying the house. So 2009 to 2010, everything from the mechanical systems, all of the landscaping, the structural, um, you know, issues with the house as well as interior decor, paint analysis. And we really prioritized what we were going to, what, you know, needed the most work first, what was imperative, water damage, clearly, you know, water intrusion came first. Um, and then after that, you know, we allocated money um, throughout the years for these different projects. This project in particular was uh, an 18-month 
uh, project of just stripping 13 coats of paint out of all of the carvings. And so it really looked like, you know, cake fondant on top. You couldn't see any of the beautiful details. But yes, everything that you see here in the house has been brought back to that time period. And we do it in a very slow process. It's not something that we need to do at certain dates or certain times. It's just want it to be done right. There's only one way of doing it, which is the right way. Exactly. And you have to find those people. How do you find those kinds of people? Well, I mean, we actually go back to different places in the city that are doing restoration themselves. And so our three uh, restorers, actually four, um, it came from the Fox Theater. We were lucky to get them to come here. Certainly, everything is plaster in this house. There is no drywall. People have retired. Um, it's not a craft that somebody passes along anymore. And so it is getting more and more difficult to find these types of people to do this work. And those craftsmen are gone. There's really nothing else like this, is there? It's one of the great, you know, dining rooms in Atlanta. The Asian experience is really coming of age in this period of time. People are really understanding as we become more, if you will, global. Yes. I understand, I mean, this is kind of like a zenith example of people really getting into that and dipping their toes in that thing. She's really kind of, she's kind of ahead of the curve on this. Wouldn't that be a safe thing to say? Yeah, I think that this, I think, room really kind of pulls together a very contemporary 1920s, 1930s feel to it with that fascination of Asian culture and what we would have you know, termed chinoiserie would be that, that fascination with, with all things Asian. Um, this room was actually painted by a man named Alan Cox. He's done a lot of great pieces of work that are still existing, mostly more commercial. Um, you know, this is one of his residential uh, pieces of work that you know, typically in residences, this was almost painted over in this room. Um, you know, Mrs. Rushton at one point decided this was not the style that she wanted anymore. And an architect named Henry Hova actually uh, talked her out of overpainting it. This is one of those layered aspects of the property owner has these very intrinsic ideas of what they may want to do with it. Sure. But due to that historical narrative, having consultation and being able to breathe in that mm -hmm. is huge because if this had been painted over, think of what we'd have lost. I mean, this guy did the rotunda. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of established. It is. That's a big one. It is. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, he, he, as I said, he'd done this in New York in 1930 in his studio on canvas, oil on canvas, and then brought it down um, and put it on the walls. And it is a very unusual sort of, there's a, a Thai Buddha over the, you know, fireplace. Um, and then there's, you know, great kind of Chinese figures. There's a Dalmatian dog behind the door. Um, so it's really just a, a fantasy uh, of, you know, figures. And uh, let's go ahead and talk about the roof. A great, um, you know, great chandelier. Um, it had come down while the, the paintings and things were being um, restored. And so it completely needed to be um, reassembled, cleaned, uh, reassembled, and then reinstalled. And so um, it's, you know, not back to its complete former glory, but it's pretty spectacular. All right, I think we need to keep going here. Let's All keep right. going. I'll let you go first. I'll follow up. Uh, how's this? <laughs> I mean, give me the story on this stuff. All right, uh, 1934 Frigidaire. Um, not original to the house because the kitchen, you know, had been restored and, or had been updated a number of times as people still update their kitchens. Um, but this was found in Clayton, Georgia. There's a man up there who completely restores old appliances. And so uh, we went up there and found a 1934 Frigidaire and then a and, uh, 28 Check it oh, out. It works. I mean, yep. this is a nice That box. was a freezer. <laughs> I mean, this is kind of like the whole thing. And it seems serendipitous as we do this. <laughs> We're in a house that Coke built. And there's Voila. a Coke. There's a Coke. So there we go. <laughs> oh, can't treat this the same way. Got to do it that way. No. This is a big deal. It is. And I am. <laughs> because I can. So this is a very casual place to have a bowl of cereal in the morning, isn't it? I mean, just the, the natural thing one would do. Right. I mean, this is insane. It is. This entire experience is pretty remarkable when you start thinking about what's been done here. But mm -hmm. really, this is where they had breakfast. Can breakfast you, and lunch every day. Uh, dinner was always served in the dining room. 
And this was created by Athos Menaboni, um, who we would sometimes refer to as the Southern Audubon. He fell in love with birds and did a, a great amount of work with um, murals, um, but also a variety of mediums. And then he's also known for always doing Robert Woodruff's um, Christmas cards every year, um, always a Georgian bird set in uh, a Georgian kind of setting. And so this was one of his really early um, you know, pieces of work. Is there a good deal of his work still left? There is, there is. I mean, some things have been destroyed, clearly. Sure. Um, but yeah, there are some really great um, pieces of work. Well, and we'll go ahead and pierce the veil, shall we say. <laughs> I can't hear you. Is that cornucopia? <laughs> cornucopia. <laughs> yes, I mean. Um, again, you know, May and her, uh, she did remarry uh, to her second husband. Her, his name was Francis Abreu. Okay. He was an architect in town, and he had an, a daughter from a previous marriage. All right. Um, Consuelo, Consi, we call her, and for some reason, Concy and May decided that they were in love with Cornucopia. And the, so, natural, the natural love affair. A natural love affair. And um, yeah, she had them placed throughout the house. And so you'll see a lot of the original pieces are still here. And I think one of the things, you know, particularly that I love is that, you know, you can read things in books and, and, you know, learn things that way. But when you come to a museum or a home like this, you actually see the objects. And so you're learning from the actual objects that you know, we're here in the 1930s, um, and, and that's you know, really where my passion lies, is, is being able to tell stories through the actual objects. Um, but it is, you know, always sort of a, you know, a, a, a seesaw or a, a compromise between what it was in the 1930s and certainly what we're able to restore and recreate. This is um, another example of kind of the grandeur that's really here, mm -hmm. but also too, I mean, this is the backyard. It was the backyard. Um, originally it was very treed, forested. You know, we've lost the back two acres, but originally this was a stacked stone staircase um, that went, you know, down uh, about 30 to 40 feet. And then beyond that was a, a greenhouse that um, she had two gardeners here that would um, tend the gardens that she opened to the public. She used it quite often for different charities and, and to raise money. Barbara, this is um, spectacular and the gardens are fabulous. I mean, this is just, isn't this fabulous to come to? It is, particularly in the spring too. Right, so in the springtime when this is really all in bloom, it's, it's really like, but this is yeah, fabulous. Spectacular. How does one really get to come here? <laughs> to come here? Yeah. You can reach us on our website, right. um, www.goodroomhouse.org. That's really great. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Again, 10 out of 10, <laughs> Barbara, well done. Thank you.